keep creating. Keep drawing, keep playing your instrument, keep dancing. And in that process, you are developing a skill, you are satisfying a need to be expressive. How do you continue your process of being a creative person? What satisfactions do you get? What's the pur purpose of it? How does art relate? What happens when you don't get recognized, but still want to be recognized and still like what you're doing? I mean, those are really, really serious questions for anybody in the, in the, in the, in the world of expressing oneself. Hello, today's interview is with Jeremy Kagan. Jeremy's had an amazing career which has spanned five decades so far. He won his Emmy Award for directing Chicago Hope. Other TV work includes The West Wing, Ali McBeal. His films include Heroes, The Big Fix, The Chosen, The Journey of Natty Gan, Conspiracy Trial of the Chicago 8, Shot, which is an incredible film as well. I hope you enjoy the interview. Here is the conversation with Jeremy Kagan. Hello, Jeremy. Thank you so much for making the time today. I really appreciate it. It's good to see you. It's been a while. How is Los Angeles? Um, well, it's gray out there today, but um, almost every other day it's been uh, uh, comfortable enough for me to get on my bike, go 20 miles, get off it, put up my tent, get in my wetsuit and go in the ocean. So Los Angeles is quite amazing. It is quite amazing. So it's now May 2021 and it has been a pretty intense year or 14 months now at this point. And I was very interested in your perspective, both as a director, also as a teacher, as a professor, what you'd advise to younger artists whose whole career plans have felt like they've been thrown out because they couldn't go to dance school or drama school or music school and what you might say to them. First of all, if you enjoy the process of creativity yourself, then wherever you are, you have an opportunity to do it. Mm. I think the distinction we have to make is between the process of expressing yourself and the results of that process. And those things are not the same. Um, we often like them to be the same, meaning I'm a piano player and I'm going to, you know, win the Van Cliburn competition and have uh, concerts for the rest of my life. That's my quote, ideal and dream. Yeah. Well, the big question is, if you don't have the fruits of this creativity, the results of the creativity, does that stop you from being creative? And I think it's really important to be able to make the distinction. Am I doing this because I, in one way, have to do it, and another way, really enjoy doing it? And whatever happens is not the reason why I'm doing it. And if you can get that distinction made, then you're going to be okay wherever you are. It's not an easy distinction. I mean, it's not because... So just releasing, releasing the fruits or releasing the results, yeah. just focusing on the process. You got it. Um, you're, you're doing this because you enjoy doing it. You're doing it because you have to do it you know you would feel bad if you didn't draw or if you didn't dance um, or if you didn't make a movie and the fact is we live in live in a time where you know the pencil is the camera um, you mm -hmm. know and everyone's got one because you've got an iphone and if you have a computer you can make movies and so it's not like that particular um, um expression which is the one that i work primarily in um is limited to if I don't have the resources, I can't do it. Um, everyone has the resources now. Um, so that, but it's a, it's a sort of fascinating issue for all of us just in terms of, you know, how we live our lives. Hmm. Now, there's the third aspect of this. There is I create uh, or I express myself because I like to do it, want to do it, in fact, have to do it. I just, you know, I know people who have to play music every day. They just have to do it. Um, it, it, it they're not forcing themselves to create. Right. They just have to do it. I also know all of us are not as evolved as we would like to be so that we are concerned about the fruits of our action. Okay, I make this movie. Is somebody going to see it? Right. Um, so therefore, I am concerned about that. And then the third aspect of this is vocational. I mean, you know, can I actually survive in the society that I live in and do my art? Um, and then, it, and that's a tough one. 
for you know many many actors as you well know in the process of their um evolving to becoming professional in the sense that that's what they do that's how they earn their money um go through a long stages where they're not acting they're doing other kinds of jobs in order to survive in the society um but they're still putting themselves out there and i often say to an actor a particularly newer actor um who would like to have this as a profession but doesn't yeah. um, and goes to audition after audition and unfortunately you know just doesn't get the job um what i say to them is for four or five minutes on that day that you have an audition you actually have an opportunity to do the very thing that you love to do which is to act right. you get five minutes today to act you may not get it tomorrow because you don't have an audition tomorrow. And unless you act in front of a mirror, which is not always a good idea, um, you may not be able to express yourself, even though you love acting. But if you get an audition, you got a chance. And if you go to the audition with the attitude, I've get to act today as distinguished from I might get the job. You'll probably give a better audition anyway. So the real issue about creativity, and it's a tough one is really being in the moment of creativity you know i i um am a great admirer i live with the dutch woman uh, she, uh, so she makes me pronounce the name correctly vincent van Gogh. is not that van, how you pronounce it yes, oh. not van Gogh, it's but with van a het Gogh. okay uh, uh, with a heart exactly oh, i said a het, a het, you know, a i know het, where you were going in, but yeah, exactly. it's, it's absolutely <laughs> but one of the things that that strikes me often when i you know he 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 was um he constantly wrote about what he did hmm. and those letters to his brother uh, all been published and when you read those letters you're reading about someone who absolutely loved to paint this is just what he loved he was totally fascinated with the nature of light. He was totally fascinated with the nature of composition. He was totally fascinated with you know, the effect that a color has on another color. Um, and he got deeply into the art that he was exploring. Mm. Now, we all know because of you know his biography is a sort of an interesting one the cut off ear and the possibility of you know suicide or murder we all sort of know oh that's you know what a terrible sad life this person led now here's the question when you're reading when he writes about painting it doesn't sound like somebody who's really depressed and really upset and you know in the movie uh, versions really in a bad place Sounds like somebody who's incredibly delighted to be expressing himself through this particular form. And my expectation is that indeed, when he was painting, this is what he was, quote, loving to do. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, I'm going to paint this so that I then can get paid. And in his case, as we all know, at least at one time, he didn't. And he, but that said, he didn't sell, sell a single painting while he was alive. Well, I say, yeah, but the point is, he was not a successful financial artist. Right. But that never stopped him from being an artist. And, <sighs> you know, I was, just, uh, I was just listening to something yesterday. It was really quite powerful. A guy named Dolphy Frankel. He was Victor Frankel's relative. Victor Frankel. Man, such for meaning, yeah. You got it. And interesting same family same name and uh, um Vic, uh dolphy frank now victor frankel was in auschwitz so was dolphy i don't think they were knew that they were in the same place at the same time maybe not have been but they both survived frankel's attitude was he saw people who survived or people who who gave meaning to even the suffering that they had meaning in the sense that they didn't become the suffering they were going through the suffering and some of them were able to be generous to other people who were suffering. And Frankel, in this positivistic result of his experience, became a therapist with this thing called, log or I guess, logic therapy or logotherapy. Okay. That is a very positive way of approaching life when you have problems. Um, the interesting thing where I'm going is that what I learned a couple of days ago is Dolphy Frankel was a painter before the uh, um, uh, Holocaust, 
was captured, put into um, the uh, uh, Auschwitz, and then because they found out he was a painter, they used him. They used him and demanded that he paint some of them because he did portraits, so he was painting his torturers. But apparently, even at Auschwitz, they had musicians who would play as people would get off the train, and by the you know a couple of hours later, they're dead. Um, they, he was also there. Uh, painting there too so it gave us this i have no idea what that was but here's the point when he got out of and survived all this he said i can't paint anymore i can't do it and mm. stop and apparently the story is he inevitably got to either visit um, his relative who was this famous psychiatrist who said to him you must paint you must go back and paint so that you can take what's inside you and express it, even though it may very well be horrific. And I, I, that really struck me hard because it's like, a, you know, I mean, I, 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 he did a, I, I, I've seen a, a couple of his paintings just recently because I really didn't know much about him. And he's, a, you know, I think a good painter. Um, mm. And he did, uh, you know, there was a, there was a portrait of, 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 of um, Eichmann and you know I thought how can you do that how can you you know paint that how can you paint the dark than the ugly uh, and even preserve it um and you know and but then it's you know you think about you know painters who've uh, like Bruegel painting hell um now he painted a vision of hell it's so bizarre that it's actually in strange ways kind of entertaining uh, but but taking yeah. it on and then you look at you know painters like Egon Schiele uh, I'm using this as an example because so many of the pieces that he did they for me I, I, I they're they're painful to look at um, and yet he did so many of them because this was just the way he was expressing himself so to anyone who is in the creative field keep creating, keep drawing, keep playing your instrument, keep dancing at home with music going on in the background, which we all can do now, which we right. couldn't do before. Um, and in that process, you are developing a skill, you are satisfying a need to be expressive, and you are, in many ways, for by the way, this last year for writers, you have no idea how much new stuff is is appearing everywhere right. because everybody's always saying, "I don't have time to create." I, I, I'm a creator, I'm a writer, and I, but I just don't have time because I have so many other things I have to do. Like what? Be stuck at home and 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 do nothing? Well, that ends up what you know <laughs> what for many people uh, lo their lives have been in the last um you know year and a half or 18 months in mm -hmm. and in that sense they've had the time if you will to it's actually you know potentially create yeah it's so gonna be very interesting like all the not only all the babies that were made during lockdown because all the people who are at home with their spouses for a lot of time but all of the all of the art that comes out of it yeah uh, you know a lot is you know who knows what we're going to see you know, there's a there's an old story about uh, Jaws that Steven Spielberg made Jaws because he was terrified of the ocean, um, and so this is a way for him. I to just get... rewatched it last week. Amazing, yeah. Uh, no, I have problems with Steven because um, I know him and I actually work with him. Um, is that every time I do go in the ocean, which is very often, I do get reminded of his movie. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs> well, I don't think we've had many sharks off the coast of uh, off the coast of Malibu, fortunately. Uh, what did you work with Stephen on? Well, um, I worked with Stephen on a show called Taken. Um, I had done a movie uh, about Roswell, the incident in 1947, which was the beginning of the UFO phenomena and the UFOlogy in America. Hmm. Uh, and I... Uh, initially it was made for hbo and then showtime took it over um kyle mclaughlin and marty sheen and it's a really really good movie about um or kind of a rashomon in the sense we tell different points of view of the same incident right uh, and what really did happen was it in fact just a mistake you know for one day the army said that they had recovered the 
crash remnants of a vehicle from another uh, from outer space mm. and it went worldwide that piece of news and then the 24 hours later they reneged and said no it was what was called a weather balloon and um it's been uh, it, 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 by the way, it's been in the news in the last weeks again because ufology suddenly or UFOs has suddenly sort of spread up again about you know what's true, what isn't true, what is really happening. Is there an, an, a division of the military that has been concerned with this? And now there was an admission about a week ago that yes, there is and has been. And so some of these sightings have been real. Now the right. question is not only been sightings, but it's contact. So I did this movie. Stephen saw right. it liked a lot. And Stephen was doing a, a, a series, a limited series um, called Taken, um, which was also about aliens coming and interfacing with humans. And um, so I did episode. Um, they were two hour movies and I did one of them for him. Um, Terrific. I don't think I've seen that one. I mean, I enjoyed seeing your Roswell movie uh, and it was quite, shocking sort of seeing what they had to go through seeing what Carl McLaughlin's character was actually going through in terms of holding it back and then how it affected his life and and his whole journey through that uh yeah, I, it's sort of a fact it's a it you know it's fascinating on one level to think about the idea that there are billions not of stars but of galaxies which means composed of trillions of stars in each of the billions of galaxies. I seem to remember it's something like more stars than, than every piece of sand on the face of the earth. And are we going to then deal with the fact that we're saying we're the only conscious, you know, beings in this entire, by the way, if we were the only conscious beings, we sure are not really respecting that <laughs> fact at all being so cruel to each other and so damaging to the planet we're living on if it's the only planet that allows for this kind of existence yeah we seem to not be getting the message no well exactly and and um I mean, again, it's sort of another area we've got in common in terms of the kabbalah and the safety at sarah and looking at the question of well it, it really fits Kabbalistically. There could be various other planes of existence right here where we are right now, just vibrating on a different frequency, just as we can't see the radio waves or the uh, or the television waves. I see we're already onto the chosen. I was going to ask you about the child, the conspiracy. It's right. We're, we're catching. No, I, it's, it's funny. So it's funny. I was thinking before, it's like, okay, we get, we're going to keep it. I asked you for 15 minutes. We're going to keep it to 15 minutes. Or are we going to do a Jeremy Kagan career retrospective? You which can, I kind of can, wanted to do. You can pick anything you want. We're going to talk for a little while. Longer. I love you, Jeremy. We <laughs> both, I appreciate it. Until we both were born, so. <laughs> but let me think about Steven Spielberg, by the way, um, because of our mentioning him. Um, mm -hmm. There's this new movie um, that was uh, got lots of nominations um, called uh, The Trial of Chicago 7. Right. Um, and back in uh, the uh, late 80s, I made a movie called Conspiracy, The Trial of the Chicago 8, because there were eight people there, not seven. And yours was the first film, because my Bialik was in one as well. Like There have there been a, That's right. of other yeah, there have been a number of movies uh, since then made about it. But this one was different, and you can even see behind me, the real people were in this movie. In other words, all the defendants were alive, as well as the lawyers. And what I did in this movie is I just used the trans scripts from the trial and the journalist descriptions those are the only things that ever got said and done and what i also did was i interviewed all of the real defendants of the the eight of them as well as their lawyers so william Kunstler and uh, um and uh one was one of them um and what I did then was when a scene in the trial would happen, um, oftentimes the real person would appear over the head of the actor and comment on what just happened. Um, and so this movie has this dynamic also of, uh, I use what's called green screens on the walls every now and then. And so when mm -hmm. someone would testify about what happened, you'd actually see what really did happen. And either that testimony was true or not because here was the documentary footage. It's a very, very powerful piece. As is, uh, and that, that final shot at the end when you do the pan round and you see the cast, but then you go around and you see the original people, the real people and yourself. Yeah. And that's it's a very powerful last shot, that one. The uh, and, and and one of the things that that um 
you know, the courage of these individuals and the importance of what they represented, which was to take on a society that really was getting darker and darker in terms of its fighting a bad war and being unjust to its own uh, citizens. Um, this was the theme um, um, of the 60s and into the 70s as well. And this movie and this trial was a representation of that. And what was disturbing is um, I found out uh, that uh, Stephen had seen this movie. Um, and about 15 or 12 years ago, he had decided that he wanted to have the, a movie made about the subject and inevitably got uh, this new, the new movie made. But in the new movie, they tell all kinds of things that just aren't true. Right. They're just, they're just, they, they, it's an interesting issue about creativity. The author got to be creative in making a good narrative, but not telling the truth. And they, and they went, so Aaron Sorkin went from eight down to seven. Well, it, well it, the seven because the eighth was Bobby Seale, who is over here. That's the real Bobby Seale and the actor Carl Lumley, who played Bobby Seale. There he is. Um, he was taken off the trial after being bound and gagged, right. uh, which was a major moment in American trial history to see somebody bound and gagged in a courtroom. Uh, and, and it was dealt with in the new movie, but it's a major issue in in my movie um and, and, and how do you yeah, how do you that. feel about that it was very i mean look i i loved i love watching your dga interviews every year because they're they're just historic this is this is the third volume of these interviews i've been fortunate enough over the last i think it's 30 years to have been interviewing the best living filmmakers of our time who have been nominated for best feature film Mm. And I interview them for about three and a half hours and then edit those interviews in terms of describing filmmaking process. And uh, we just literally two weeks ago published the third volume. And where can uh, we buy it? it? It's available right now at the Directors Guild of America website, dga.org. You can right. buy it there. Um, the first two volumes you can get on Amazon or any book at any bookstore. Right now, um, we, we the D directors go decided to publish this the, the, uh, ourselves or themselves. So um, that's where it is right now. But it'll be, I'm sure, on Amazon soon as well. Um, it, it, it's great stuff. I mean, it's yeah. If you're, if you're a film, if you're a film lover or a filmmaker, this is these this collection is some of the best material because it's it's you know the filmmakers you admire talking about how they do what they do which is exactly what you want to know so it's quite it's quite something but um i look forward to reading it and it was so it really feels like an education like a, a mini film school when you're having those conversations and it felt especially poignant with this year's when Aaron Sorkin was on the panel and you're there and having it was merely, merely knowing your context yeah so could you tell me about that it was really difficult because yeah. um First of all, I I've also worked for Aaron Sorkin. I've directed West Wings. I think right. Aaron Sorkin is a, is is a genius, an incredibly creative guy. Um, uh, but he made a decision to uh, to take what we'll call the license of creativity and go beyond what was truth in order to quote tell a good narrative um, and things like um, and there will, I'll just give you one example. Um, David Dellinger was one of the defendants. David mm -hmm. Dellinger was a peace activist. He was older. David Dellinger couldn't show up to this particular scene because he was in jail again for protesting. Um, he was someone who protested fighting in World War II because he, he was a, um, a, a true pacifist. Uh, mm -hmm. Even in a, in a, quote, just war, he was a true pacifist. And he was one of the oldest people there. Um, and uh, there's a scene in the new movie where, because of things that happen, he actually hits somebody, he hits a guard. Well, that never happened. He never hit anybody. In fact, when Bobby Seale, the African American we were just pointing out over, <laughs> or over there, yeah. was being bound and gagged, he, David Dellinger, put his body in the way of the guards to protect. So he got pushed around, but he never did anything to the to the guards. That's not the way it is in this movie. Now, it's a good dramatic scene. Somebody who's a peacenik who finally suddenly punches somebody because it's that mm. person's so wrong. But that's not what happened. 
And I remember seeing a webinar with two his two daughters, uh, who are women now, older women, and both of them were crying because this is how their father now is going to be remembered mm. as portrayed in this new movie. And that's not who he was. And that never happened. And that I, in fact, not to be a spoiler in this, in, in the new movie, the end of the new movie is a, a powerful scene where some names of American soldiers are read. Um, well, that actually did happen, but it didn't happen the way it, it's portrayed in that movie. It's in my movie as well, because the person who read those names was the same person, David Dellinger, not Tom Hayden. And not only did he read the names of American soldiers, and this is even more powerful if you actually think about it, he read the names of Vietnamese who had been killed that week as well. Because this is a war in which people were getting killed on both sides and many innocents on the Vietnamese side. And they were opposed to the war. Yeah. So it wasn't just about Americans getting killed. So that's in the real trial done by David Dellinger, the guy who never punched anybody. And that's mm. in my movie, but not in this new movie. And I'm so, guessing you, you haven't had the conversation with Aaron Sorkin. And here's what I did. Um, I, it was really difficult because I, this is not, my role there was to fil facilitate how do you do what you do, not what you do or why you do it, but how mm. do you do it? That's the, that's the role. So, you know, um, if, if, um, if, if the, the, the filmmaker who made the triumph of the will, if she were alive and it were one of these interviews, it wouldn't be, why did you work for Hitler? But it would be, how did you film those scenes with these hundreds of thousands of people? Mm. Because the filmmaker of the triumph of the will this this, this pro Nazi Hitler piece is amazing. It, it is totally amazing. So that's another conversation you know, um, um, about why you did it. And I did ask Aaron in the green room uh, before we started, if in fact he had seen my movie, because he never acknowledged that. And he said, oh yes, I've seen your movie. And I said, hey, Aaron, let's, uh, are you willing to have a conversation with me about the two approaches that we had? And we'll, we'll do this via the University of Southern California School of Cinematic Arts when I teach. And he said, yeah, sure, let's do it. I'll let you know if it ever happens be very very interested in a way the value of telling this story it relates to the issue of the fruits mm. that if you are concentrating on what you're going to get from what you do as distinguished from the doing itself you're missing the point of the doing so um this is my first feature film and I'm very excited now now I I want to be part of Hollywood I you know when I got out here to the American Film Institute and Hollywood was Hollywood and involved with the American Film Institute and there and the others that were there the 12 of us the uh, Caleb Deschanel the inevitably the great cinematographer and Terry Malick the brilliant filmmaker and uh, th th there was an amazing group of people David Lynch uh, Paul Schrader, there was very, you know, and there were very few of us, and a lot of these people were film buffs, film lovers, wanted to be filmmakers all their lives, unlike me. Um, but I was catching the bug of, and the idea was, of course, then you want to get to make a feature film, so, sure. which, which when I went to film school, I didn't care about at all. I was totally uninterested. But now I'm, I'm interested and I was very fortunate because my career moved very, very quickly. Um, uh, I got into television and directed a very famous TV series called Columbo right away. And that got me more famous. And then I started to be asked to write and direct movies for television, which I did. And inevitably I wrote one which was a very political piece. Uh, and it was a, quite a scandal about making it because uh, the West Coast thought it was the best film and they wanted to open the season with it. And the East Coast thought it was an anti-American film and didn't want to show it at all. Uh, a movie called Catherine. Um, and it was the seven year story. And it actually is one of the best movies I've made. A seven, and I wrote it, um, seven year story of the radicalization of an American girl from a rather wealthy family to becoming part of what was known as the Weather Underground. 
Just and you've got space. great put I mean the performances you've got out of oh, yeah. Sissy Spacek. Art Carney and every week, yeah. I mean, yeah. like, and Sissy Spacek played the lead. She this was her second movie. It's a really, really powerful film uh, mm. called Catherine with a K. And those of you who are interested, you, you can find it on again Amazon ads. It was, well, it's it's really very special. Um and it you know, in fact, that guy Abby Hoff and I was talking about it, it said it was the best movie uh, describing the culture and and uh, world of the 60s um, yeah. and the radicalization of so many people, young people during that time that that was made. Anyway, I cast Henry Winkler to play a role in it. And Henry um, was just emerging as an, uh, you know, he'd been working very steadily as an actor in small parts, but he was merging as a superstar on television, um, this character called the Fonz. Just was happening about the same time. Um, he we had a great time making the uh, in the movie Catherine that I directed. He, he did a fabulous job, and he was so proud of his performance because mm. it was a complex performance, and he really delivered. And then now that he was the Fonz, the Universal wanted to make a feature film with him because he was that popular. That's the kind of thing that would happen. Um, and he suggested that I become the director. And it turned out I had made a movie about Scott Joplin, the composer with Billy Dee Williams playing the right. lead. And that movie, interestingly enough, played at the London Film Festival. I've got okay. the, the the award over here, but I didn't know it. They didn't tell me because it was made for television, but they released it as a feature. And it was okay. quite successful for, for what it was supposed to be. Um, and I had also worked for the producers making a television movie. So the, all three things came together, the producers, the studio, and Henry. And I got the opportunity to have my first feature. And Henry, by the time we were shooting, was a superstar. Everywhere he went, thousands, thousands of people would show up if they, if they knew he was there. Um, and it was really quite amazing. Uh, the people who were from older generations say the only time they'd ever seen anything like this was, was with Frank Sinatra, who was this giant yeah. superstar. And everywhere where Frank went, people came. We had a scene in which it was uh, up in Petaluma, California. It was going. To, it was a dirt race track. It has to do with one of the friends of the of the, of the character. The character is reuniting with former war buddies to go form a worm farm all together up in uh, Northern California, uh, in Eureka. Um, they're going to all get together and have this business. And he's now seeking out all of his friends. And it's it's a, it's a you know it's a it's a it travel it's a journey film. Um, and what's happened to his his former buddies um, and him. And, uh, so there's this scene uh, where one of his buddies um, uh, is uh, supposed to be in the racetrack, um, uh, uh, this local racetrack, but the buddy really has a car, but he really won't do it. He's got a lot of problems. And I had cast this actor that had been a working actor um, um, for 10 or 12 years, um, and we'll play third and fourth parts in various television things and movies, um, named Harrison Ford. Um, and Harrison and I got along pretty well, and I was able to convince the studio that take him because we had Sally Field and Henry. And he Winkler. made you a dining room table. You hired him to make a table. That's correct. Too. He was a, he is and was then a very, very good um, a craftsperson, and he actually remade my dining room table. Um, and, and we would hang out and all the rest. And well, we'd ask the locals to come to be in the background for this scene. Um, and so around 2000 people showed up, mostly young, and it started to rain. And the rain was really bad and we realized we couldn't shoot. So um, I asked um, Henry, would you talk to the crowd and thank them for being here? And, and apparently it's going to clear up and ask them if they'd be willing to come again the next day and thank him. And Henry was fabulous and he got up there and he was really appreciative. And, and I look over in the corner and I see Harrison and Harrison is like trying to get out of the rain and he's wasn't much places because this was outdoors and it was pretty soaking wet and these people are screaming and yelling for for Henry and I looked at Harrison and I said you know that's going to be you in a year and Harrison what are you talking about I said well I was in an office of my lawyer Tom Pollock also just recently passed and I saw these black and white stills from this movie that were the most astounding images I think I've ever seen you know, George Lucas, who I you know, American graffiti and all the rest. 
and this is this sci film sci fi movie and you're in it and there's even from those stills that I saw this is going to be a giant and Harrison's going are you kidding me. I mean, it's a B sci-fi movie. I mean, it's like, you know, we were like, oh, look, look, you know, a ship's over there and ship's over there, you know, bang, bang. It's just, it, it's not, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to, maybe the movie will be, that's not me. Uh, you know, but here's the thing. Brilliant, brilliant. And that Star Wars. It did become, Harrison becoming obviously one of the giants in the film history, mm. but what was really true was Harrison liked to act he and really committed and I'll give you an example when I cast him in this piece he was supposed to be somebody from the south because uh, the story as I said it's a road movie and, go, and he said can you uh, get me a little money so I can go to um, um, Alabama to just hang out for maybe a week and pick up you know just the some of the culture and the way the sound is there and this is before we started shooting. So, you know, I went in and figured out a way to be able to finance that. It wasn't in our budget. But the point was that he was an actor who cared so much about doing a good job as the actor mm. that he wanted to be able to really do his homework. And his homework meant I need to be where these people are so I can decently uh, create a character based on th that world. And which is exactly what he did. Yeah. And so what I'm saying to you is that he is committed to the art, whether he was famous or he wasn't. Because he really, really enjoyed doing it um, and cared about it. And that's the lesson for all of us. It's not whether you're going to be famous or you're going to be rich. And we, most of us want to be famous and rich in one way or another. Sure. It's about do we find a bliss and satisfaction in terms of what we do and is some of that of benefit to other people how was it working with Chaim Potok the chosen is such a historic movie be very interested to hear well here he is uh, I, I the, I'll tell you the, uh, the 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 result that I often uh, like like to mention because you know because of what he said um, mm. he said look this uh, story has been translated into over twenty different languages and now that I've seen the the movie you've made it's definitely the best translation so far so Big I think compliment. I really really was quite quite happy with what we were able to do and. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's fascinating, this whole issue of where you come from, how you got here, what's in your DNA, what's in your sort of epigenetic um, psychology that goes over generations and generations. What happens when you enter into a society that allows for you to be assimilated where for thousands of years you were in societies that absolutely said you're an outsider mm. and that's how you were going to be treated. You know, one of the amazing things about America is the co-option of culture. Um, and that although we still have a long way to go in terms of our respect for the indigenous people who were slaughtered when the Europeans came here. Mm. And of course, a country that is essentially built on slavery and, and really admitting that and dealing with it, we have not. And I think that's one of the reasons why we have such horrors as the gun violence as a psychic, uh, almost karmic mm. uh, punishment for not being able to tell the truth about how we got to where we are but the point is of assimilation and in my case as a second generation american jew my grandparents you know escaped from um, pogroms and uh, destruction in, in eastern europe and came to america and they quickly as many many american jews did began to abandon a lot of the orthodox um behavior and traditions because the society was saying yeah we're not going to let you go to the best colleges and it's going to be more difficult for you to get a, a law degree and a doctor but we're, we're still going to let you in mm. and you'll be able to sort of deal with stuff and so for a lot of 
Jews, they said, well, what if I change my name and I became a little less Jewish? I don't wear a yarmulke every day. What if I do that? Maybe I'll be more accepted in this society, which is exactly what happened in the, you know, from the 1930s through the yeah. 1950s. And, and you had endless phenomenal actors like Danny Kaye, whose real name was, you know, it's, it's just, you can miss them. They all changed. Well, my, my, my grandma's cousin, my fourth cousin, Edward Goldenberg, who he shortened the, he, he stayed in London at my, my grandma's house when he'd head over from Romania, landed in America, shortened the Goldenberg to, to the G, took on Robertson, uh, Robinson, and then Edward G. Robinson. Yeah. There you got it. Exactly. Abandon the name. Yeah. Exactly. So one of the things that I think Chaim, as a writer, and by the way, Chaim was also a painter, which is what makes mm. Asher, I have a couple of his paintings, uh, which makes Asher Levin an interesting thing, because he painted all the time, um, is that for Chaim, he was dealing with this issue of how do you be, quote, an American and hold on to being an American um, and enter into that society and also hold on to how you got here to, over the last 2,000 years. And I think that was really, really a very much the theme of so much of his work. So when he wrote this book, uh, The Chosen, um, it is it opens up literally with this baseball game where a bunch of very, very orthodox kids are playing baseball to prove that there's good Americans, World War II was going on, as any other American and baseball is America. So that's how he opened it with a baseball game of Orthodox Jews playing it. Mm. But here was the difference, and this was the interesting issue. The opening of the book is a baseball game, and the baseball mm. game is specifically to prove that Jews were as American as anybody else right. during World War II. The two sides in the book are both Orthodox Jewish communities. In other words, the, the, for example, an Orthodox Jew wears a yarmulke all the time. So there was a group of Orthodox Jew, Jewish kids wearing yarmulkes and a group of what's called Hasidic kids. These kids also wear yarmulkes, but they also look like they came from Poland in the 1600s because they wear black coats, yeah. and black shoes and, and, and jackets and white shirts. And they look very, very different. And, you know, in all the communities, there's ones in London, of course, and there's all in, in Brooklyn and in Los Angeles, there are a number of Hasidic communities. These are very specific, very pious, very Orthodox Jews, but have follow a different tradition, mostly based on certain kinds of legacy families that had incredibly brilliant rabbis or called rebbies who were, in some cases, very much existing on many planes where they were able to heal their community, sometimes physically as well as emotionally, um, because of the wisdom and the connection that he's had. And then they would have followers and, okay, Hasidic movement all around the world. Also Orthodox. Now, when I took on the doing the movie, I said to Chaim, you know, I think we need to expand this to um, a larger community. And what do you mean? What do you mean? Well, I think the one should come from what we'll call modern American Judaism. They don't wear yarmulkes all the time. They look more like other Americans. Mm. This is the conservative American Jewish movement, uh, the, the reform Jewish movement. And the other being Hasidic, just as, as he is in your book. And we talked about it for a while. And Chaim didn't say no. He understood it and, you know, said, look, well, you're making the movie. I'm, you know, I'm not the person in control here. Um, so let's see what happens. Um, and I think it was a very smart move because I wanted there to be access for anyone who watched the, the movie. And so, so, they could, so they could see themselves on screen. Yeah, you okay. Oh, I'm not Jewish, but I, you know, I, this kid looks they look like, like me. me. Yeah. You know, talks like me. And so I guess I don't know what it means to be Jewish, but, you know, it doesn't feel like, oh, that's weird. Because definitely those guys wearing the black hats, 
they're weird. And right. in fact, even in the opening statement in the movie, um, our, our character, the other boy, says these people were really weird, even yeah. about yeah. fellow Jews, but they were because Jews. So that meant access to it. And that's a it's a fascinating issue because years later, um, Barbara Streisand uh, met with me because she was making um, Yentl and wanted to know some things about how I dealt with certain stuff and 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 we had a fabulous conversation and boy talk about an art collection it's got one of the great art collections art and, and, and um art deco fabulous material Egon Chile speaking of that well, what well, so what advice did you give her for Yentl well we were talking about this the, the, the re only real advice I ended up giving her was to cast a young actor named Mandy Patinkin to play opposite her because I knew Mandy and he'd been in my second feature film and um, I knew he had this spectacular voice and she'd never heard of him and I haven't you know she cast him so that probably is the only good advice I gave her my thing you, you cast him in his first role didn't you sorry yeah I did his first job yeah yeah in, the, in a movie called I did called for the big fix but mm. the, the thing about um that she made an interesting decision she said in this movie the i'm not going to have the characters wear side curls or called peos or peyot which is when you look at an hasidic jew you'll often notice they don't cut this part of their hair and that's because in torah it says you're not supposed to cut the corners of your hairs so includes the, the sides of the point, beard yeah exactly yeah. The part, exactly. So they'll, you know, their beards will be or wild. Rather, rather, rather the chin. Some people say got the, those are and, the sides. And these side curls will be there. And you see them, you know, if you're walking around different parts of London, you'll see them. Then they're weird, they're weird and all the rest. And she said, uh -uh, I'm not going to do it. I said, but Barbara, your piece is not a modern piece. It's a, you know, it happens in the 19th century. I mean, that's, everybody did that who was out of these particular realms. She said, no, it's too weird. People are not going to be able to deal with it. And one of the one of the great moments for me, which I've told before, but I'll tell, quickly tell it. When we were when we were shooting on uh, um, on the streets, and here you can see some characters with those curls. You see Rod yeah. Steiger over, over here with the his 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 payos in this character. It looks legit. Here. It looks yeah. very okay. legit. Okay. Yeah. And and so what was interesting was we're shooting our first day. We're shooting that baseball game, and it's really 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 hot. And we're in an area of Brooklyn where we're shooting, which was not a Jewish area. In fact, it was an Italian area of Brooklyn. That's where I found the, the, the place to shoot the particular ball game outside. Yeah. Great, great, great location. And the extras, the background artists, the young boys who were playing on the baseball team that was part of the Hasidic group, went to get some lunch in you know, the local neighborhood. And so they go, you know, it's an hour lunch break. And all of a sudden I'm looking over here and suddenly I see these kids and they're running towards where we all are. And they've taken, they're, they're pulling off their pants and saying, we're actors, we're actors. Because a bunch of tough kids in the neighborhood looked at them, thought they were sort of like these weird and started to tease them and started to push them around and they got frightened. Not real. It's, it's not real. It's. I mean, it's. It's funny. It's also interesting from a a symbolic perspective of getting around an anti-Semitism issue. Like, actually, we're not Jewish, and we can pull it off. <laughs> okay, by the way, here's here's Mandy. Patinkin. There it is. I'm impressed how you're pulling stuff out. Like you've got all your photos there. This so is he, from. I'm this sorry. is from the big, the big fix. We, when I met Mandy, um, uh, it was interesting. Um, Rich, this is uh, Richard Dreyfuss and I when we were making this movie. And we were in a casting room and Mandy came in. And Mandy was way, way too young for the part he was going to play. Which is interesting, by the way. The part he was going to play was a character loosely based on, and this is sort of fascinating in its own right, loosely based on this guy over here, if, you, if my cursor can be seen, if you can't see I can't see the cursors. Oh, yeah. That guy there. Okay, that yeah, guy, that that guy there is, Duncan. that's Abby Hoffman, okay. who was one of the most brilliant, funny, insightful, um, astoundingly uh, um, daring human beings I've ever met. Amazing, amazing guy, Abby Hoffman. Um, uh, a guy named Michael Lembeck played Abby. Is this Michael there? I think Michael's. Yeah, Michael's. And right that was there. the role that Sasha Baron Cohen played. Yes, yeah, Sasha, and that's Michael Lembeck, who I actually think, although Sasha Baron Cohen is really good, 
see my movie conspiracy and see even a better performance because he's fabulous anyway great character and of course he's in my movie as well well in the big fix um there was a character that was uh, kind of loosely based on on abby but who then does, goes underground abby had to do that as well um and that's who mandy was um, um uh, coming in to audition for um inevitably gave it to uh, um, um john lithgow who was a, a star at my college when i had gone to college okay. as one of the great actors and john of course ha- is one of our great actors and this was i think his first or second movie that john did uh, but he was older um but when richard and i met mandy we both were so impressed again an audition an actor comes into an audition yeah. he's so good so fabulous not right for this particular part but totally committed we talked to him and we just said this guy's amazing and i said let's put him in the movie uh, some, we'll, we'll, figure, we'll figure out something so um i i spoke to to our author roger simon who wrote the big fix and i said let's figure out something for him and i told manny look if you're in la while we're shooting you just call me and we'll have something for you and amazing. Yeah, we, we not only did we have some for him, he had on the set met his wife of the, his two children. And so it was definitely, uh, as they say in, in, uh, in Yiddish, beshert, it was he beshert. participating. Right. So here's Mandy playing a, a pool man. It's a great scene. It's a great yeah. scene. It's like full of energy. It's funny. Uh, yeah. So you gave him his first break in the movies. Then you helped him get Yentl. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'm and- sure he's appreciative. Well, actually, uh, to be honest, I don't think he had the best of times um, making that movie, although he's quite brilliant in it. Oh, here's, a, here's another movie that, 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 that you actually helped out on um, that's in the background. And um, this is a movie that, uh, you know, I made, um, uh, you know, a couple of years ago dealing right. with the issue of gun violence. Um, so um, I was on, yeah, I was on set briefly in the bus when the, uh, the guy yeah, was exactly, out hiding exactly. his gun. Um, and and so shot is a very powerful statement on gun violence in America, the way that you tell it, Russia mon inspired, presumably from these different perspectives, and the way that the final scene plays out with these different options, these different alternative realities. Did it achieve what you'd hoped it would achieve? Did it, I mean, did the vision? I remember when you were writing it, and when obviously when you were filming it. I mean, did it come out as you as you envisioned it? Uh, the movie. It, it the movie turned out to be what i wanted the movie to be which is an interesting thing about all of us as we create and go back to your very first question Mm. particularly if you're creating something that is an exterior expression of yourself but even as an actor sometimes you know you'll be very self-critical one of the things i i when i'm working with actors do my best to have them not be in that space yeah um, so that they don't observe themselves because that's my job Uh, not their job Um, but you know when you make something I think there's always a point in which uh, you as a a writer friend of mine once said and I think he was quoting somebody else you never finish anything inevitably you kind of quote abandon it right it goes out on its own Um, and you know I I'm always can look at um, it, it, it's an interesting con- oh, okay I'll, I'll tell you um, I, I think this I'm trying to remember who the director was that said this uh, a, a, a famous a classic director um, of the 50s and, and the 40s said look um, if you have six good scenes in your movie and no scene you're embarrassed by then the movie's okay now think about it it's only six scenes. That's not the whole movie. The filmmaker was Howard Hawks. Who, who, the filmmaker was Howard Hawks who said, um, if you have six scenes in your movie that you feel are good, mm. and there's not one scene that you're embarrassed by, your movie's a good movie, uh, for, at least for you. Um, and I, I, I think that's stuck in the back of my mind here. And I think I had more than those six scenes in this movie. And I don't even think there's one that I'm embarrassed by in this film. I think there's a couple ones that make me a little bit, you know, but no, I don't think I'm embarrassed by. I think the movie is really powerful. It did not find its audience in the movie theaters. It's still out there. I you know, saw it. I went to sit in Santa Monica. Yeah, and it looks good there on a big screen. It's great. Yeah. I loved it, yeah. But you know, listen, I, the, the issue again is now, 
here's the difficulty is if you're making movies or you're making films that you want to make because they uh, have a social issue that you want to get people either aware of or you want to motivate people to do something, then it's important that the movie gets seen. Absolutely. So that's a tough one. I feel like this movie is of value in the American conversation about our obsession with guns and our absurd uh, gun violence issue. Um, and that seeing the movie, the experience of seeing the movie is you as the audience member are getting going through the point of view of what would happen if you, the audience member, got shot. Yes, it's, it's played by Noah Wiley over here, um, but oftentimes this the way it's shot is you're seeing the world and the experience through his eyes mm -hmm. so you're going through the experience and i think one of the big issues one of the big issues of of gun violence in america specifically but also a, you know, a bigger issue of the issue of global warming is that until it actually affects you you don't really think it's an issue for you Mm. And here's the unfortunate part of this. Obviously, in America, no place is a safe place anymore. You can't go to church, you can't go to school, you can't go to movies, you can't go to outdoor theater and music events because, or you can, but sure. in every one of those things that I just mentioned. You know, look at, look at our friend Jess Rosenthal, who used to go to our shuls, Pico Shul, um, who's one of the Fox radio reporters for Southern California. She, I remember just saying that her entire career was either covering, majority of her was, career was either covering fires in California or shootings. Yeah, yeah. So you look That's at that, of it. and then, then you look at also the issue of, 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 of global warming and specifically, I was just looking at the beginning of this wonderful documentary about David Attenborough at 92. Yeah. And one of the things he's talking about in his specific case is when it doesn't affect you directly, you don't really, it's not a problem. Which is interesting because like the, the, the Torah is very much not that perspective. It's saying, no, think about the widow, think about the orphan. That was the voice of the prophets, which you've written about or you've, you've portrayed in your movie Huff Torahs. Uh, saying like no like the fasts don't count like what's the point if you're gonna overlook the people who are oppressed and to really think about outside one's experience it, it's it's all it, it's very difficult because our egos are so protective of us as they should be that it's difficult to to sort of you know be in a place of empathy um and you know it's so interesting too because you know, you've taught me a lot by being able to expose me to the to to Rabbi uh, Jonathan Sachs, who recently passed, and he wrote a, this amazing book that I've been listening to over the last weeks called "Not in God's Name." Mm -hmm. And one of the themes of the book is the interconnectedness of us all, and that the idea, um, you know, used as a part of the storytelling, Abraham is the prophet father figure for Judaism, Christianity, right, the Islamic world. So in a way, we're all related. And, and, and when we can, as he puts it, realize that we're and I know this is gender specific, but the, the rhyme is good realize that we're brothers, rather than others, we have the chance of creating a, a world of collaboration, cooperation, peacefulness, and allowing for differences. Now, do you find a danger, though, within, within the art, the, as opposed to the, the MGM, ars gratia artist, art for art's sake, without any agenda to it? Is there any difficulty or any conflict of a message like this, a humanitarian, a religious, a God-centered, morality-based message, that's a, mix, mixing that in with art? That's a wonderful, I mean, that is a wonderful question Thank you. Um, on so many levels. On one level, for me, um, I got turned on to filmmaking because of its social and political aspects. That, you know, so therefore, here's a scene from 
um, from from this 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 movie Battleship Potemkin made by Sergei Eisenstein during the twenties, in which this was a scene advocating the, uh, the 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 voice of the populace being the most important po- ruling voice as distinguished from dictators, autocrats, rich people. Yeah. I mean, it was a very very political movie and a very famous movie and one of the classics of cinema. And that turned me on to saying, oh, I would like to be involved in cinema. Um, I was not somebody who was a movie lover and knew about directors or actors, any of this when I was young at all. And this this is from college days. So, yes, I I, I was an amographic artist. Yes, I am a musician. Yes, I did act. Yes, I did direct theater. Yes, I do write. All of those things. And what I realized was cinema does all of those in in one particular genre, you know, form. Um, but I didn't know that until uh, getting exposed to this. And so for me, the idea of the artist uh, as a advocate was something that was really, really strong. One of my favorite artists um, um, when I was young was an uh, American artist, American Jewish artist named Ben Sean, whose work is extremely political. Um, and, and that, you know, commenting on the famous Sacco of Vanzetti trial, and these incredible drawings that he did of that and paintings that he did of that and, and uh, the, the horrors that happens because of uh, nuclear uh, issues. And he would, these would be the subjects of what he would paint about uh, or draw about. So for me, that that's true. Then there becomes the question of, okay, you're looking at a, a, a piece by Jackson Pollock. Well, what's it got to say mm-hmm. now here's the thing for me that piece by jackson pollock is in personally incredibly okay powerful i'm absolutely enamored and affected by this but you can't say is it is it sort of like political like this movie behind me no when I was a student uh, at um, NYU grad school studying film with the intention of actually becoming a kind of a, a teacher or a scholar that would uh, essentially um, use film as a, um, a way of teaching. Um, but I wanted to know how do you make films in order to be able to be, uh, you know, appropriate, mm. and not be sort of like, as the phrase goes, as an armchair general here. So, um, you know, it was important for me to, to be able to um, uh, really know how to make movies. And as uh, I started to study, I fell in love with the process of making movies. But the point is, I used to do two things. I, um, when I really felt anxious uncomfortable i would go to the museum of modern art um uptown and i would sit in front of monet's water lilies a close-up of which you're seeing right behind me at this moment and what would happen was it would literally calm me down and it was a, a very kind of it was a gift and I'm not sure that that was the intention of the artist, but that was how I received the, these images. Sometimes I'd go up there to look at uh, the painting by Picasso called Guernica, which I don't mm. have behind me, um, for almost the opposite reason, because it was such a violent piece, uh, anti-war piece. Um, and the war was going on at the time. Mm. Uh, you know, I was a conscientious objector and dealing with all of that stuff. And to see that piece of art as a political statement um, would stimulate me. So I, I, I think that the issue is that the, the idea of art for art's sake makes sense if you say, but what is art's sake? And if art's sake is to raise the consciousness of the viewer that Mm. consciousness may very well be um in the very classic way of what um, aristotle talked about which was arresting the mind that great art arrests the mind and what he meant by that arrests the mind was that great art stops you 
from having busyness in your mind and focuses you on the presence of you and the piece of art that you're looking at. And in a way, that's a transformative experience that makes for you the possibility of a higher consciousness. So in a way, it's not for the sake of art itself. Mm -hmm. It's for the but it's what purpose. art it's sake the... may very well be, which right. is to allow you to look at, you know, a painting like this one behind me, which is essentially color and form. Is it is it content? Is it telling you to get out there and stop global warming? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. No. Maybe indirectly, because you're not going to have water lilies sure. <laughs> anymore if the, the world burns up. Right. But, but the point is that I, I'm saying that I find the the that I don't I don't think art itself ever exists without its reminding us of our connections. And of course, there are so many ways of getting messages in any way. It just depends on how they're being couched in the voices of. The characters like the chicago seven or the or the chicago eight and the issue is more whether it's good art or whether it's not good art i i think also what you're saying you know it's one that we teach a class um or i'm involved in teaching a class called media for social change and one of the things that my colleague um uh, uh, michael taylor who also teaches the class with me one of the things that he will often emphasize i mean he will really sort of make a point of this repeatedly um is it is how can you enclose the message in a narrative story that will entertain? That becomes the question. Mm -hmm. How can you do that? So it isn't so much stop global warming, um, which the message may be, but it's like, oh, what happened to my garden? It got destroyed this this, this afternoon. It got totally burnt out, and now all our tomatoes are there. Well, you know, what are we going to do? Or my, you know, my basement's flooded, and then how are we going to solve that problem and all the rest? And so, it, it's a human story in which you can identify with characters in a certain situation, um, and then step back and say, oh, I get this exists like that movie shot because this availability of guns and the use of guns to solve solutions is a serious problem right right um, so it's an interesting issue about how the message and you know there's that famous line you know if you want to say a message send a telegram said one of the studio studio heads famous studio heads in the past but you know it was a different era. It was a different era. And gosh, Shakespeare was making political statements the entire time. I mean, the whole thing's full of it. That's what the whole restoration period is all about. Restoration comedy in Britain is just couched in irony and couched in sarcasm. I try and explain, well, I, I explain to people that the British have been developing sarcasm for 350 years because we had to post Cromwell. It was the only way to make statements in the theatre. You know, it's interesting about that, it, that, that very issue because we, we've been... We've been sort of dancing with it um, uh, recently, um, and um, and and it, it, the dance has 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 been, um, you know, how, how do you how do you do how do you get your, this messaging in, in so that you actually make a difference, right? You can actually motivate somebody to do something, right. and it's it, it it it. I think it's a fascinating question that you know, and I don't think there's an easy answer to that question either. But Other than to do the art, do you make the art as great as you can and hopefully inspire people to, to take yeah. action. I'm interested in the perspective of jealousy or security or self-confidence. I wonder how it feels for you when you're interviewing all these directors pre-Oscars and their, their stuff is up and their stuff's in the Oscars. Do you feel like I'd like to be on the receiving end rather than the interviewing end. Or how do you how do you process that? <laughs> and I don't know if I should ever ask you this question. Like, no, I, I think it's like I, dancing I, I, the years, but I think it's a great question. Just like the pounding of the head here from one of this is a, this, I mean, 
there's no question my ego gets tied into all this. This is a, this is a drawing from um, the uh, animated uh, movie that I so just intense. Did. Your half tours are so intense. The pictures, the, 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 um, the, yeah. It, it, um, it's, it's, it's called the half tours. Then uh, it, it's uh, about sixty drawings that are uh, partially animated in this animated movie that I just did. Um, it's, it's a beautiful movie. film. Like the music is lovely, and the way oh, yeah. I like so the way they've good. done the animations. Yeah. yeah, David David Krakow, a great great clarinet player customer player did the music for me but what 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 i what I, well, i've got this up here is you know uh, it, my ego is just as tied into stuff as anybody else is right. so you know um well i remember when i um when i did my first feature film heroes um what i was concerned with was being recognized i wanted to get good reviews Right. And then a number of my student films had gotten into film festivals. And so therefore, you know, that actually started my career. So I was being recognized, you know, well, somebody saying you're good. Um, and the movie uh, got some good reviews, but it got some mediocre reviews. And I was I was hurt. I was upset. Um, and what I didn't realize was the movie was the second biggest money winner for Universal that particular year when it was released. In other words, it was a, in Hollywood's terms, a, hit. a giant hit. Yeah. Giant. And in fact, it got me my second movie, the, the Big Fix, at Universal, because it was such a giant hit that, they, hey, this, guy's, this guy knows how to make us money. Um, but I didn't know that. I honestly, because I didn't read what were called the trade magazines, Variety and Hollywood. I didn't read them. I didn't care. I wasn't interested in Hollywood. I was interested in making things of value. Yeah. Um, and not value in the sense of money value, but value in the sense of they might make a contribution in some way into consciousness in one way or a little motivation. I mean, Heroes is about a return veteran that has PTSD. I mean, I... And it's Henry wow. Winkler. It's Henry yeah. Winkler of all people, which is yeah, and who interesting casting. Yeah. yeah. So the 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 um the sort of issue about jealousy of other filmmakers or other uh, films like this particular mo movie. Um, I've submitted it to a number of Jewish film festivals, and it's been rejected by a number of them. And I was like, oh, my, why aren't I good? Isn't it good enough? Now, luckily, um, the uh, what is a popular cable network in America called the, the Jewish Live Television Network is going to show it, so right. it's going to get seen. Right. But my ego was hurt about that. But when I meet these other filmmakers um, who um, who really are, you know, masters, uh, you know, it, it, there's this. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if I were, you know, on that stage one day? Uh, yeah, for egotistically, yes. But am I as talented and as gifted as these people that I'm interviewing? Mm, I think I'm a really great moderator, but they are great filmmakers. That's very humble. <laughs> well, I don't even. I think it's just the truth. It's, it's you know, I look at, you know, I look at their films and I say, if I'd gotten that job. Could I have done as good a job as they? And the answer almost always is no, no. They, they either they were the right person for the, the job. No, I think at times I've been the right person mm -hmm. for that particular film. In, in all honesty, you know that th this this movie here compared to you know compared to the the, the Chicago trial, I think this is a better movie. Okay. In fact, I know it's a better movie. Um, so in that case, I was the right person for that job. And, and in doing, uh, you know, something like like The Chosen, um, I was the right filmmaker. Um, this this movie is a very good movie, and I was the right person to do it. Yeah. Would it uh, uh, qualified me to be up on the stage of the Directors Guild for best uh, most outstanding directing of the year? No. But is it a good movie? And 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 was I the right person? Yes, it is. So and, yeah. I think sometimes the timing uh, and the subject matter um, they they meld, and you know, and we've seen this. Listen, you look at there's some painters whose there's a period of their work that they're really great, mm. and then there's a period there isn't. 
And in filmmaking, this is really true if you track people's careers. There'll be a period where their work is really special. And then if they keep doing it, oftentimes it's after that period. And that's good. Knowing when um, to walk away. Yeah. And how does that and how so how does that work with the actor? And this is something I've been mulling over having stepped away from Los Angeles, albeit due to other circumstances, but, but having been there for 10 years. And this whole question, which I think many people have of, well, at what point do you walk away? Uh, or yeah, what I, point do you get real with it? I don't think you ever, it's, it's interesting. I, um, I just read this quote yesterday. I, I, I really didn't like where the, the, the quote came from because it was Richard Nixon, who was not somebody I particularly admire, but apparently I, it's yeah, quote okay. is. And the quote is that um, it, it, you never fail, you quit. Mm. Um, which is actually a very smart thing to say. Because if, if you recognize, I mean, it's like I often, I often quote um, Samuel Beckett, um uh, talking about creativity try fail try again fail better now if you step back and listen to that it's recognizing we're you know <laughs> we may be sell them we may be in the image of the creator and i think the most important part of that word in the hebrew is the idea of it being a creator mm, mm. an image maker because that's what human beings do we make things we're amazing at making things and do we make something if we paint it as beautiful as a rose no i don't think so you can be a phenomenal painter and that can be a great road, but it's not quite there. Mm -hmm. It's not so we're same. we're if if we're modeling ourselves about the ultimate creator, we're never going to be quite as good. It's just we're not going to even just, with the yeah. robots we're making and even with all of the AI that's coming out and all of the incredible sort of medical things of uh, um, replacing hearts, etc. We're never quite going to be able to. So, we never, no. And so, that's the. Sorry, go on. No, but that, then so, so for our issue is to be able to recognize that we're striving. And I think there's. A, it's, it, I can't remember the quote. You may know it better. It's, it, 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 it's a, one of the a Jewish, either in Psalms or, or somewhere, or Proverbs. It's not, or maybe it's in Talmud. It's not for you to finish the job. Lo alecha hamalacha ligmor. So it's Pirkei what ethics of the fathers in the Mishnah. It's not your job to to finish the task, or it's not your task to finish the job. But neither are you to desist from starting it. You got got to get moving in it. Be also. So therefore, to me, and particularly as an actor, an actor continually expands, which is the reason why some actors' careers are 50, 60, 70 years long. Because as they grow and change, there are other parts that they're playing as human beings and other parts they're able to play in, in the various pieces of theater or film that exist because, you know, they're not going to play the 15-year-old because they're now 55, but they're going right. to play the 55-year-old. And so for me, if you enjoy acting, and this is the real question, mm, mm. then there's never a reason to stop, even though you may never get the opportunities to have that fruits of the acting, meaning I'm making a lot of money of it, or people know about me and I have fame. Those things may never happen, but you still get to act. And, even if someone isn't that good? But the question is, the someone isn't that good. What does that kind of mean? You know, it's an interesting look. There are lots of, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, a, a, I'm a good example. I am absolutely not a great graphic artist. I'm just not. I'm okay. Okay. But there's a part of me that almost has to do it. Some, I, I almost have to draw it. It, it you know, I, I, I'll. I'll I sometimes I'll assign myself, which is an interesting issue about life when you assign yourself things to do versus, you, you, you know, doing them um, because um, 
there's an un unexplained reason. Right. So every, every every week, every week you're doing the Torah portion. So so here today and yesterday, I don't know right. if this is coming across at it's, all. It's green screening a bit, but we can see it for the most part. Yeah. But you know, here's the beginnings of you know what's going to be. All those circles are going to be filled by probably the end of the day. Um, are these drawings really good drawings? You know, I've been just looking recently at at our crumb, and and um and thinking boy he's such a great graphic artist i mean he's just so good and i'm never going to be that good but that's not going to stop me from drawing you know and i'll maybe learn some things i see how he does a certain shading so maybe i'll be able to incorporate the, that in what i'm doing as i learn from other filmmakers but it's, say, let, it's letting go of being in Mocker or whatever it happens to be or MoMA, like it's it's letting go of being in the National Gallery. And it's well, it's being, letting yes, it's yeah, it's letting go of fame, and, and that's it's the big thing. Yeah, yeah, it's letting and I, I use the word it's letting go of the fruits. It's it's it you you plant the tree, and you enjoy the process of the growth, but you're not focused on that fruit. And that's I think the thing that can kill so many careers because of the popular approach of this is what it has to look like and then you have to quit. If you take, and this is, the, this is a compl complex question, but if you take pleasure out of the creative work that you do, mm. and I'm speaking to you, but I'm speaking to anybody, and I'm not saying that that's all you do because there's the self-critical, I didn't like that line I just drew, or sure. well, I didn't really get the essence of that moment of performance. And that, that's just all going to be happening. But if there also is pleasure in doing it, you know, and the pleasure may be fleeting, but there's still pleasure. It's the idea of follow your bliss, a very difficult phrase yeah. to hold on to. But if there are moments of it, then it, absolutely deserves your doing it no matter what happens and in your case which is i think quite wonderful is you know for many actors unfortunately they are they can create a character but they can't write one right they can't make one up you on the other hand can write and therefore you can create for yourself stuff to do mm. which is fabulous um, and in that sense, okay, 10 people see it, 10 million people see it. Doesn't really make a difference. If there's pleasure in the process of making it, and I know there is because I've seen what you've done, and you I can just it. feel like, oh, this guy's having a good time. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, it, you know, then that's justification for doing it. Um, and I think it, it, it's, and by the way, this is all, this is, this is, look, we're here i don't know whether what if jewish sages have used the word it'd be interesting to know this um that you're you're a human being because you're in school being a human being is a schooling the question is what are you supposed to learn mm. well kabbalistically i won't go into that but yes absolutely we're going through the incarnations to fix certain things the tikkun which would be another way of well it. nothing yes. that, the whole idea of, of repairing why we're here to come along to some to repair the world I, I got but that's not quite what i'm talking I mean, about yeah i'm talking about something else is maybe before you even get to the idea of i'm going to repair the world is what am i learning that in fact would even motivate me to quote want to do that rather than let's say just egotistically satisfy all my desires mm -hmm. yeah and i don't have this sort of answer to this about uh, the schooling but i know part of the schooling has to do with time and someone said to me by the way that the very first mitzvah in torah is about time it's, it's counting the month is the rosh chodesh it's counting the new month it's the first and that's the first that's, that's the, the first, first one we get of all of them is, which is so weird because you think about it okay here are these you know these five books this one doesn't even occur until somewhere in the second book but what's all the stuff in the first book which Strange is we're the shaping stuff? we're shaping the... the world by saying though this is the new month we're shaping we're actually having that input we're framing it got it and we're also dealing with making time sacred 
Mm. Right? Okay, so now here's the issue. Where do we exist in time? Our brains function to protect us. That's our best, in quotes, weapon. And that's why this species has been relatively more successful than any other species, because look, the cheetah is faster, the horse is stronger, the butterfly is far more beautiful, mm-hmm. it flies, we don't. I mean, what do we got? Well, what we got is this. Right. This is quite amazing brain. Uh, maybe the whales have even better ones and understand more how to be dealing with time. Because here's the issue. One of the things that this thing is about is rehashing the past and rehearsing the future. Rehearse the future so I can avoid bad things happening or make, quote, good things happening. Rehash the past. Boy, I, that was a great memory. Wish I could do that again. That was fabulous. Or, boy, did I mess up. I have better learn from whatever that was. But here's the interesting thing, as sages from all teachings keep reminding us, you actually exist in only one time, Mm. which is right now. Can we be here right now? Well, part of us, for sure. Um, But it's, it's sort of that challenge of sort of, recognizing the now is so full with so much that it, it, that it, it, in a way, in a way, so it's a wonderful um, movie of a, this should be the last thing we talk about, unless you got another question, but there was a wonderful movie um, um, of a book by Somerset Maugham called Razor's Edge, Mm. uh, movie with a black and white version of it. And there's a a scene in uh, the movie that comes from the book, because I read the book after the movie. And interesting enough, the scene in the movie is better than the scene in the book, which is a very rare thing. And I'm talking the words, not just the scene. But our character is restless and searching for meaning. Literally, he is. And he doesn't want to, quote, settle down and become a stockbroker um uh, and, and you know make money and even though he has someone who he dearly loves but she wants him to have that kind of life she wants him to be successful and rich you know she just does she loves him but she doesn't understand what this searching for meaning in life is what what, what what is he doing and inevitably he meets somebody who suggests he goes to india and he goes to india and he meets uh, a guru there wonderful performance by whoever the other actor is. And there's this phenomenal scene where the two of them are talking about finding meaning Mm. and and being of value to other people once you find the meaning. And the guru talks about, look, everybody's restless. Everybody feels the chaos. You're not unique in any of this. But inevitably, you're going to find it within because that's where God really exists. And there are many paths. There's the path of faith, there's the path of good work, there's the path of study. But all paths inevitably lead to the same thing. So he hears this, um, and, and he says, it's, this is really, this is, but it's really difficult to, to get to a place of equanimity and compassion and peace. And he says, yes, yes, it's like walking on a razor's edge, is what the, the guru says. But inevitably he says it's time because he stays and studies with this man and he's going to go up into the mountains, the Himalayan mountains, and be there alone. Mm. And he does. And our character inevitably visits him. And he says, the character looks at him and says, I, I see. You don't have to say anything. I see. In other words, the guru sees like the Rebbe would see, yeah. look at you and know. I know you've changed. Uh, tell me. And he, the, our character, Tyrone Power, probably the best performance he ever gave, talks about waking up one morning just as the light was coming through the clouds over the mountain, just that moment of transition. 
and all the sounds and all the sights and all of his feelings that he felt interconnected with everything that and he was beyond time and it was as he felt if it continued anymore and this is an interesting point he said i thought i would die because it was as if and then the guy finishes the phrase for him god and you were one hashem echad and the guy nods and says yes and i've been repeatedly like last night repeatedly looking at this scene trying to memorize it i don't so have raises edge right? yeah i haven't seen the film yeah. i'll check it out because the issue is how can we literally get the schooling here and probably the schooling is of what you just said earlier which is you do take care of the person who's sick you do extend yourself to the person in need and whether that's exemplified by the widow or the orphan or by organizations that are taking care of the widows and orphans or that that it is that connection that really is the reason for maybe our schooling mm. um, and if we can develop that connection even if it means that connection is we're painting for 10 hours a day and seeing nobody but yet that process is is somehow expanding us on another level stanislavski talks about it as communion and that religious experience and it is it is that religious experience got it it's very much there beautiful jeremy kagan thank you very much good to be with you again